that is cyst. Now, you already know the meaning of cyst actually. This is not a new term at all. Okay, but this topic will be in covering uh, what is the definition of the cyst, uh, what are the types of the cyst regarding classification as well, how you approach a patient who comes to the hospital with cyst, how to his take history, how to do physical exam, how to do investigation. And finally, we talked about some important types of cyst. Now see here. Cyst is a closed cavity, a sac containing liquid or semi-solid debris, which is lined by epithelium or endothelium. Now, this is an important uh, definition. So let me underline some important points here. It is a closed cavity or sac. Remember this, which contains liquid or semi-solid debris. Mainly it contains liquid most of the time. And the wall is lined by epithelium mainly, but sometimes by endothelium as well. So this is the cyst. Now what is the a different, a differentiation between a cyst and a mass? Mass is a solid structure. And cyst okay, is a cavity which has liquid inside and it is lined by epithelium or endothelium. Now there are uh, two types of cyst. We roughly divide cyst into two types, true cyst and a false cyst. Now see this, look at the uh, difference between them, true cyst and the false cyst. Now true cyst has epithelial lining. This is a true epithelial lining, but sometimes that true epithelial lining may be destroyed by either infection, okay, or by some other pathology, and it is replaced by granulation tissue. This is a process of healing now. And the good examples are sebaceous cyst and a thyroid cyst, or thyroglossal cyst, you can say. So these are true cysts. So in one sentence, you can remember, it has got true epithelial lining. Whereas false cysts have no epithelial lining. Then the question comes, what is the covering of that cavity or sac then? Okay. And the answer is the inflammatory exudate. It will organize and form a membrane which is covering that cavity or sac. That, that uh, you know, uh, exudate, okay, which act like a membrane is not a true epithelium there. That's why this is known as false cyst. And a perfect example is pseudocyst of the pancreas. Now, in case of acute pancreatitis, this is called acute inflammation of the pancreas. The common causes are, anybody can tell me what are the common causes of acute pancreatitis? Yes? Sir, uh, obstruction in the uh, uh, pancreatic, uh, uh, pancreatic duct and there is a hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, good, very good. I agree with his answer. Anybody else? Now, let me quickly, you know, go through this type of important point. So, please uh, pay attention here. Alcohol. Alcohol is one of the very common cause of acute pancreatitis. Another is called gallstone. Okay, gallstones. Now, that gallstone should descend downwards into the common bile duct. And if it is lodging, near the sphincter of OD. If it is lodging near the sphincter of OD, remember that, it will block the pancreatic duct as well. Now there is a pressure development in the pancreatic duct, which can lead to acute pancreatitis. So gallstone is second most common cause of acute pancreatitis all over the world. The third, okay, is absolutely right, hyperlipidemia. Hyperlipidemia is another cause and trauma, blunt abdominal trauma is another cause. There are so many other, okay, but autoimmune disease as well. Exactly, autoimmune disease can also lead to pancreatitis. I agree with you. But cystic fibrosis. Exactly. Cystic fibrosis can also lead to acute pancreatitis as well as chronic pancreatitis. But these are more common. Uh, immediately, you know, if this question is asked to you, you can answer like that. Now, let's come to the point here. In case of acute pancreatitis, because of uh, inflammation of the pancreas, there is severe damage done. And in this condition, 
the pancreatic juice is leaked okay outside and it has got very powerful enzyme those enzyme can auto digest pancreas gland as a result of this the pancreas gland will form one cyst and that cyst is called pseudo cyst of the pancreas it is not a true cyst and it, it will form a mass in the epigastric area which can be found out by ultrasonography examination so let's move on now let's classify uh, this cyst so we roughly divide this is this is another type of classification okay into acquired cyst and congenital cyst you see there acquired cyst and congenital cyst so let's talk one after other regarding the acquired cyst the first type is called retention cyst the meaning of retention is if the gland okay duct is obstructed now there are different types of gland in our body roughly again the glands are divided into exocrine gland and endocrine gland exocrine gland means it has got a duct so the secretion of the gland will flow into the duct and then go to the particular area now what are we talking here if those ducts are blocked now what will happen the secretion will be retained there and these are called retention cyst very easy term and these are the example like sebaceous cyst bartholin cyst cyst of parotid gland cyst inside the breast and epididymal cyst now student already know what are the meaning of this sebaceous cyst is present on the skin definitely because the term sebaceous means it is associated with sebaceous gland and this sebaceous gland are present on our skin okay that is important point bartholin cyst now where it is present anybody in the vagina exactly is right in the vagina okay bartholin's gland is present in the female so it is present in the vagina cyst of parotid no parotid gland parotid gland is the biggest salivary gland so is it to understand breast and epididymis breast in female epididymis in male okay so these are called retention cyst another one parasitic cyst you see here parasitic cyst sorry see this let me highlight this again now one of the good example of parasitic cyst is a hydatid cyst now which organism causes hydatid cyst disease what is the name of that organism anyone anybody plasmodium falciparum no no anybody it's a type of sir echinococcus sir echinococcus exactly it's a type of tapeworm this is known as echinococcus granulosus echinococcus granulosus okay remember this name it is also known as dog tapeworm dog tapeworm i'm serious so this echinococcus granulosus or dog tapeworm when it is present in different tissues this disease is known as hydatid cyst the most common organ which is affected is liver it will form a big cyst lung is another organ spleen bone as well as brain can be affected by hydatid cyst now this is a very interesting condition now the treatment is surgery along with some anti helminthic drug but during surgery one point is very very important here this is a practical information for you if the surgeon is spill a bit of fluid outside the hydatid cyst okay it can lead to fatal allergic reaction it can even lead to anaphylaxis and from that area a lot of other hydatid cyst will be grown so the surgeon has to be absolutely sure not even one drop of the hydatid fluid is leaked outside when they remove the cyst so this is a good example of parasitic cyst 
Okay. Now see that the another is hyperplastic cyst. Now see this hyperplastic cyst. A example is a mammary dysplasia again inside the inside the breast. Another is a degeneration cyst. Degeneration cyst. You can see here. A good example is uterine leomyoma. So degeneration cyst means it is slowly, you know, degraded away. So leomyoma is a benign tumor inside the uterus. If that benign tumor is degenerating, the central part of that benign tumor may turn into a cyst. So we call this a degeneration cyst. Neoplastic cyst, cyst adenoma and teratoma. Now, cyst adenoma and teratoma both are very commonly found in ovary. These are ovarian diseases. Cyst adenoma is a type of benign tumor, or you can say it's a type of ovarian tumor which is benign in nature. So it acts like a cyst. And teratoma, many students know, teratoma is also a type of ovarian tumor. But teratoma can develop outside the ovary also. Okay, I'm not saying that. But ovary is one of the commonest organ for teratoma development. So, what is the hallmark of teratoma? Let's talk a little bit about it. See this? Anybody can tell me what is the hallmark of teratoma? Anyone? Maybe you have studied in pathology? Sir, uh, this tumor contains hair, muscles, teeth, and bone like structures. Now, Irfan is absolutely correct. Okay, he's right. This teratoma uh, has uh, different types of tissues which may be developing from all three layers, all three germ layers. That's what I mean. All three germ layers endoderm, mesoderm, okay, and ectoderm. So the, the tissues which may develop from all three germ layers are there. Please mute yourself, somebody is causing noise there. Now, so some examples you can quickly give like skin like hairs like nails muscle gland all of these type of tissues are present inside the teratoma teratoma can be benign or can be malignant okay this was information would be enough and they are very commonly found in ovary another is called distension cyst now there is over secretion of okay uh, the normal function of the gland. This is thyroid cyst and ovarian cyst. You see this? So thyroid cyst occurs inside the thyroid gland, ovarian cyst occurs inside the ovary. So they may be containing the normal substance in an increased amount. Exudation cyst, example is bursa and hypercell. Now exudation is a byproduct of inflammation or friction, repeated friction occurring around the joint. And uh, there is a, a cyst developed between the joint okay, and the soft tissue, between the ligament and the soft tissue, or sometimes between the tendon and the soft tissue as well. These are called bursa. So bursa is a cyst-like structure which is filled with fluid. And the main function of this bursa is to decrease the friction. So it, it is developed around the joint area. Remember this. Most of the time, the lining of this bursa is a synovial membrane. So of course, it has synovial fluid inside. There are so many bursa present around the knee joint. What is hydrocell? Anybody? What is hydrocell? It's a hydro good okay i agree with you this is a fluid collection around the testicle but you need to be very specific here because testicles have different layers okay so hydrocell exactly means fluid collection let me write that for you fluid collection in Tunica vaginalis. Tunica vaginalis. So this is a cavity, a sac of tunica vaginalis, which if it has fluid collection, this is known as hydrocell. Very common problem in male. Very, very common problem. One of the common disease which leads to hydrocell is 
elephantiasis, okay, elephantiasis or filariasis, which is quite common in tropical countries. And it is caused by Ukeraria bancrofti, which is a type of, you know, parasite. Ukeraria bancrofti. So let me give that important information. Okay, see this. So I'm talking about one important cause of hydrocin, that is filariasis, and the causative organism of filariasis is Ukeraria bancrofti. This is very common organism. And this organism or parasite, I should say, is transmitted by Culex mosquito bite. But sometimes it can be uh, transmitted by other mosquito as well. So this is a uh, classification of acquired cyst. Now, on the other hand, let's talk about congenital cyst. Now look at the uh, different terms there. Congenital cyst may develop because of failure of connection of the tubular element inside the kidney. Failure of connection of tubular element inside the kidney. Now, if I go into the detail, kidney has a lot of nephrons. That is a functional component of the kidney. And that nephron has got different parts. It has got proximal convoluted tubule. And even prior to that is a glomeruli. Okay. And there is a Bowman's capsule. Glomer glomeruli is present inside the Bowman's capsule. Then proximal convoluted tubule. Then loop of Henle. Then distal convoluted tubule, tubule, and ultimately collecting duct. Now, if there is no connection between these different parts of the tubules, okay, with other uh, parenchyma of the kidney, then the person will have polycystic kidney disease. Polycystic kidney disease. You see this. This polycystic kidney disease is of two types. You have studied that in pathology. I'm sure about it. Uh, whether you have still, uh, you remember this or not, okay, it is another point. So these are autosomal dominant, okay, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Now see this, I'm just writing the short form here. Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, which occurs in adult. And another is infantile polycystic kidney disease. Infantile polycystic kidney disease. Now, infantile polycystic kidney disease is a autosomal recessive type and uh, adult one is autosomal dominant type. Regarding the infantile, these infant, they die quite early in the infancy because this is a very severe disease and many of them, okay, they suffer uh, from, uh, they suffer from chronic renal failure quite early in the life and that's why this is a very severe condition whereas adult they manifest around the age of 45 to 50 years and they also suffer from renal failure later on as well as hypertension so this is polycystic kidney disease just just remember a few points there okay another is ectopia of various tissues like dermoid dermoid and epidermoid cyst dermoid and epidermoid cyst now, dermoid is also present in the midline uh, you know in a different parts of the body we'll talk about that later on epidermoid cyst is another term for sebaceous cyst so this is a ectopia of various tissue means the tissue may present in a different form hamartoma example is cystic hygroma so let me explain a little bit about this important a point hamartoma now, anybody can define hamartoma first yes who can sir said it is a non cancerous type of tumor and said it grows from the uh, from the tissue and cell of the area in which it grows sir mainly you are right actually you are absolutely correct hamartoma is a non cancerous type of tissue so it looks like a tumor but it has abnormal growth of normal tissue there. So those tissues are not, you know, uh, malignant type or neoplastic type. There is more growth of the normal tissue in that particular area where it belongs to. That important, you know, uh, pathology is called hematoma. 
and one of the good example is cystic hygroma now please pay attention here i'm going to talk a little bit about cystic hygroma this cystic hygroma is commonly presenting around the neck area around the axilla and around the groin area okay but most important uh, you know area is the neck it is quite common if a baby is delivered with 45x not okay karyotyping what is that 45x not karyotyping called down yes. syndrome no. what is that syndrome. turner Good. syndrome turner Good. syndrome okay this is turner syndrome so remember this cystic hygroma very commonly occurs in a girl who has turner syndrome when she is about to burn you know sometimes cystic hygroma is already there it is already there and sometimes it may develop later on and the cases have been reported the cystic hygroma may be causing uh, uh, may be causing difficulty in delivery as well it may be causing difficulty in the delivery because there is a big mass around the neck area and that big mass is causing obstructed labor as well now what is this okay let's talk about it remember our you know body has a lot of lymphatic channel and the function of those lymphatics is they collect the lymph from one area and they uh, you know drain the lymph to the bigger lymphatic channel that's how they work so the problem start when those smaller lymphatic channels are not connected with the bigger lymphatic channel so what will happen now of course they will drain the lymphatics but those okay lymphatic fluid will be retaining in that particular area because they cannot go into the bigger channel now and this particular situation develops which is called cystic hygroma now what is the treatment it's a surgery you need to resect that part you need to remove it completely then the problem will be all right let's move on another is presence of normal vestigial remnant like a thyroglossal cyst branchial cyst and uracal cyst okay now see this thyroglossal cyst branchial cyst and the uracal cyst the thyroglossal cyst is present in the neck remember how thyroid gland is developed it is developed with the help of a thyroglossal duct so if that thyroglossal duct doesn't completely disappear it may develop into a cyst this is known as thyroglossal cyst i'll talk about this later on in this particular topic this is important question from the exam point of view branchial cyst they develop on the side of the neck remember on the side of the neck during the embryological time okay there are different branchial pouch and the branchial cleft as well as branchial arch so this cyst develops there okay this is called branchial cyst uracal cyst develops okay near to the urinary bladder there is a connection between the urinary bladder and the umbilicus okay and that particular area if it it persists later on also it should disappear absolutely but if it persists this is known as uracal cyst so these are uh, uh, the presence of normal vestigial remnant vestigial means they should disappear but they are still present and they are causing a lot of problem so this is a bit of classification regarding cyst now we are moving to a very important part okay please pay attention that is classification or classical feature sorry or clinical feature or classical feature you can say we have just classified it now let's move on to the clinical features now when you examine a cyst okay it is a spherical mass and that mass is filled with fluid or semi solid debris or material so when we palpate that structure what is the feeling that is very important point this feels is smooth is spherical okay and it is it is a fluctuant type of swelling 
now what do you mean by this fluctuation you see here anybody can tell me what is fluctuant swelling let me ask this question and then i'll explain it anybody That means maybe. it's changes sometimes it's look big sometimes it's look small like that okay bakir uh, anybody else sir, sir in fluctuation sir, swelling when we press at one side yeah. uh, you know, by palpating the finger sir the, sir, the pressure suggests that the bead is the area contain that uh, fluid sir that that sort of uh, and sir it, it like say it uh, changes its uh, volume side of so it is a, a fluctuant swelling Okay. Okay. Irfan was also answering, so I will again give him the chance. Yes, Irfan, go on. Sir, in fluctuating swelling, when we press at one side, then the fluid inside the cyst move and the other side, and uh, same, same, and uh, same at other place. Okay. Good. Good. Now see that different students are answering, but you know the meaning is there. Okay. See this. That's why. if you understand it you can answer in your one word that's what i mean i always want that from a student now this is having liquid inside or semi solid material inside so when you press from one side of the cyst for example let me use a pointer here see this if we press it here okay this is a big mass here if we press with our finger a uh, two fingers here and with the other hand if we feel with two fingers of the other hand on other side of the mass you know we we feel like the liquid is moving there okay the liquid is displacing our finger this is called fluctuant swelling or fluctuation test positive this is a very important feature of a cyst it is not present in solid mass that means there is a liquid inside another important uh, you know A point here. Okay, see so this is trans illumination test. Now let me explain this. Trans illumination test is positive in a cyst when it contains clear fluid only. If it contains a bit of turbulent fluid, if it contains blood, if it contains pus, if it contains some semi solid material, then trans illumination test is negative. Now how we do that? So look at this picture now. Okay, here, see this. This is a case of cystic hygroma. It is present on the neck in a newborn baby, and uh, we first of all we switch off all the light. Okay, we close the curtain in that room, make that room relatively dark. Then uh, take a, a pen torch and show on one side of the cyst or the mass with the pen torch, and it just illuminate like this it just glow like that everywhere if it is having clear fluid this is called trans illumination test positive and these are the example for you cystic hygroma see this because it has got a clear lymph there hydrocil usually it has got a clear fluid and even meningocil uh, these are a good example where trans illumination test is positive but if there are they are infected remember the same type of pathology trans illumination test will be negative now because after infection it will turn into exudate it may turn into pus and now it doesn't illuminate so that is the negative test another important type of test is called indentation test now this is positive in dermoid cyst and a sebaceous cyst because they have got semi solid debris inside they do not have the typical fluid so when we press them okay there is a indentation mark present this is called indentation test positive it is not positive in all type of cyst and another point test the overlying skin at the central part of the cyst if it is fixed to the overlying skin then it may be a case of sebaceous cyst at the same time sebaceous cyst has so many other feature as well so what is the take home message is from this slide remember cyst means it has fluctuation test positivity trans illumination test may be positive may be negative it depends what is the content of that cyst 
and indentation test may be positive may be negative again depends on the type and some of the cysts may be fixed to the overlying skin let's move on okay now what are the investigation of a cyst what investigation you like to do one of the most commonly done investigation is ultrasonography now what is the importance of this ultrasonography let me clarify this for you what is the content of that you know mass ultrasound will clearly tell us what type of substance is present inside is it fluid or is it some solid material so ultrasound is a very very important test especially if the mass is present inside the body then ultrasound is very very useful if it is present on the surface of the body we can even feel it if fluctuation test is positive we already know there is fluid inside needle aspiration of a cyst is another one okay you can also call it fine needle aspiration and we know what is the content of that cyst we can send that material uh, uh, to the lab as well ct scan if there is a suspicious type of cyst okay for example some malignant type of cyst is there the cyst which is called degenerated cyst some cyst in a difficult part of the body if you want some detailed information just go for ct scan mri can be done similarly excision and biopsy is another important investigation you just remove the cyst and then send to the lab and they will give you the report what type of cyst is that especially whether it is benign or malignant now uh, we have got few seconds left let's talk about the complication of cyst what complication can happen inside the cyst see there it may uh, have infection it may bleed inside it may suffer from torsion can you know uh, complicate as a torsion and that ovarian cyst may you know become ischemic or may, may degenerate also calcification can occur as a result of infection as a result of hemorrhage or as a reaction to parasite as well an important example i can give here is hydatid cyst which is commonly calcified cachexia cachexia is a extreme weight loss it's a feature of malignant type of cyst a good example is malignant ovarian cyst here and obstruction cyst is a mass so it can give obstruction to any nearby structure if there is a huge ovarian cyst it may comp compress the pelvic vein and there may be decreased blood blood return or venous return from that area leading to edema formation and all those things so these are some of the complication of cyst just try to understand it okay let's move on now there are some swellings which are brilliantly transluminant or transillumination test is positive in this type of cyst ranula cystic hygroma and a lymphatic cyst hydrocele epididymal cyst and meningocele so some other you know uh, uh, examples are also given there for you so see there so ranula is a new term for you probably so this is a cyst that forms in the mouth okay or in the oral cavity under the tongue and this ranula usually has saliva as its content saliva is a very clear fluid isn't it so ranula is transilluminant treatment of ranula is resection or excision cystic hygroma and lymphatic cyst already talked about cystic hygroma may be present from the time of birth because some of the smaller type of lymphatic channels are isolated from the bigger one so they continue to drain the lymphatics in that particular area which may form a cyst hydrocele is fluid collection in tunica vaginalis of the scrotum epididymal cyst is present in connection with epididymis in case of male and it has a very uh, particular appearance during the transillumination test and we call that chinese lantern pattern remember 
in the Lantern Festival. Lantern Festival is the last day of the Spring Festival in China. And during that time, the typical lantern, okay, which they, you know, leave on the sky, that, that typical type of appearance would be seen uh, in case of transillumination test. And what is meningocele? Let me ask this question. What is meningocele? A meningocele is a sac or sir, a cyst protruding from the spinal cord, the meninges or spinal cord to be specific, sir. Okay, good, good. You're right. So the term itself uh, suggests the answer there. Okay. Meningo is a term for meninges. Sil is a cyst. So it is a cyst which is comprises of meninges as the layer. So if I want to explain further, this is a part of spina bifida. If the posterior part of the vertebra is deficient or defective, then what will happen? The meninges will bulge out and there is shear shift at the center. So this type of situation is known as meningocele. Still, spinal cord is not herniated outside. If the spinal cord also herniates outside, we use the term meningomyloseal. Meningomyloseal it is called. So meningocele means spinal cord is still in its normal place, but only meninges are herniated outside. Let's move on. Now, with this, let's enter into the cutaneous cyst discussion. So this is an important part of today's lecture. So please pay attention here. So cutaneous cyst is a circumscribed dermal or subcutaneous papule or nodule, which contains fluid or semi-fluid material. If we talk about serious cyst, this is a semi-fluid or semi-solid type of material. That's why indentation test is also positive there, okay? And most of the cysts are subcutaneous or cutaneous cysts are fluctuant, fluctuant. Now, never forget this important point. Fluctuation test is positive in case of cyst because they have fluid or semi-solid material inside. The cutaneous cyst, okay, can be classified by different anatomical location. Not only cutaneous cyst, any type of cyst can be classified like that. If cyst occurs in the thyroid gland, we can call them thyroid cyst. If cyst occurring in the ovary, ovarian cyst, okay, like that. They can also be, you know, classified according to embryological derivation or by histological feature because of the lining of the cyst there. Some of the embryological derivation in the name of the cyst are thyroglossal cyst branchial cyst, isn't it? Uracle cyst, which is, you know, you know, which was discussed before the break. So remember those examples immediately. True cyst have an epithelial lining. We all know that now. And that epithelial lining, if we talk about the cutaneous cyst, maybe stratified squamous epithelium or other forms of the epithelia. Some cysts have no epithelial lining at all, and we call it pseudocyst. A good example is pseudocyst of the pancreas. Okay, so let's move on. Now, before we go into the cutaneous cyst discussion, let's talk about the structure of hair follicle. This is a very important, uh, you know, uh, thing we must know before we go into the pathology. Now, all of you please focus here. This is known as hair follicle. See this. This is the hair which is coming out from the skin. Now the outer part of the skin is known as epidermis. So this part is epidermis. Okay. This is this this till this area is epidermis. Epidermis has got different layer. Now if we talk about the thin skin, epidermis has got five layer, a uh, four layer. And if we talk about the thick skin, epidermis has got five layer. Anybody can tell me what are the name of those layer? Maybe you have, uh, you know, studied them somewhere. Okay, anyone? If you do not know, let me explain this because this may be a new knowledge for you. 
So if you go so if you go the, uh, the stratum basal, stratum spinosum, stratum uh, stratum gallosum, stratum uh, lucidum, and stratum corneum. Okay, good, very good. Okay, he's absolutely correct. Now see that for the sake of so many other students, let me write this. Okay, uh, this is a special topic in dermatology, but we are talking about cutaneous now. So the teacher may ask you this type of question. So stratum. Okay, corneum, stratum, corneum, then stratum, lucidum, okay, stratum, stratum, okay, see that, granulosum. Stratum, spinosum, spinosum, and stratum basal, also known as germinativum. Stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and stratum basal. Try to remember this, okay? These are very, uh, you know, favorite questions of different examiners. Now, out of them, the stratum lucidum is absent in the thin skin. That's why we have only four layers. Now, why I'm bringing this point here? This is quite important one. The stratum basal is the bas basal layer. Now, you can see it here. This is stratum basal, and it has a special property of regeneration. All the other cells of epidermis are derived from stratum basal layer. So remember, and never forget this golden statement, if the cells of stratum basals are permanently damaged, okay, then skin cannot regenerate. But if any epithelial layer which is above that is damaged, then stratum basal can still replace them. That's why any superficial you know, erosion or damage to our skin can be replaced. But if a deeper you know, types of damage occur, like in bones, deep bones, if a stratum basal is damaged, then skin cells can be replaced. Now, let's move on. Let's go to the dermis. So where is the dermis here? See this. Okay. Now, if you come below this stratum basal layer or basement membrane, this area is called dermis. The whole area is called dermis, okay? Dermis has got two parts, reticular dermis and papillary dermis. Now, papillary dermis is the superficial one and reticular dermis is the deeper one. Dermis has got so many important structure. You can clearly see here. One of the important structure is called hair follicle, which you can see right now. This is structure is hair follicle. The hair is present inside it. Okay, the root of the hair it is called. See this, this is root of the hair. Now it is again divided into so many different parts. The bulb is the terminal part. See this bulb where there is a root present, supra area, isthmus and infundibulum of the hair follicle. So infundibulum, isthmus, supra bulbar, and the bulb area. And uh, inside that hair follicle, sebaceous gland is opening. See this? The duct of the sebaceous gland, just trace it. It has opened inside the hair follicle. That's why the sebum, which is the uh, secretion from sebaceous gland, comes out from the same opening from where the hair is coming out. So this is sebaceous gland. Now, another, okay, an important uh, structure which is connected with the hair follicle is known as erector pili muscle. Okay, in some of the texts it is written as erector also, it doesn't matter, erector or erector pili muscle. Now, this is a smooth muscle. So, which nerve is supplying this muscle? Which nerve? Anybody? Which nerve supplies erector pili muscle? What type of nerve? Sympathetic. Exactly. Excellent, Abbas. Very good. This is sympathetic nerve. 
a sympathetic neuron. Never forget that. This is smooth muscle. Smooth muscles are supplied by autonomic nerve system. And here, this muscle is supplied by sympathetic nerve. That's why when a person is afraid, when a person okay, is a bit nervous, the hairs would be straight on the outer surface of the body. And this straightening of the hair is the function of erector pili muscle because they contract when the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated during flight or fear. Then what will happen? The hair will become a bit straight. This is an important question which may be asked in different exams. Other things, this is the medulla of the hair shaft, cortex of the hair shaft, inner root sheath, outer root sheath, and these are the different parts. Let's move on. Okay. Now let's classify this cutaneous cyst into different types. Now these cysts are roughly divided into cyst with the lining of stratified squamous epithelium, cyst which are lined with non-stratified squamous epithelium, and cyst without an epithelial lining as well. So let's go into the detail. Now all of you please uh, focus here. These are the cutaneous cyst with the lining of stratified squamous epithelium. Epidermoid cyst is the most important one. There are so many synonymous terms for this and the most commonly used is called sebaceous cyst. Epidermoid cyst or sebaceous cyst. Another is milium or milia. This is very common in many people. Milium or milia, these are small, okay, very small type of sebaceous cyst itself. And this small cyst contains keratin inside them. So there is a small keratin, okay, material, which is seen on the surface of the skin. This is called milia. Singular is milium, plural is milia. Another type of cyst, which is lined by stratified squamous epithelium is called trichelemal cyst, okay? Trichelemal cyst, the meaning is, it is derived from the root sheath of hair follicle. So it is a, a bit deeper. Dermoid, okay, dermoid is another one. Dermoid can develop anywhere where the two embryological structures are fusing with each other. In the fusion area, dermoid cyst can develop. I'll talk about dermoid cyst a bit later, okay? It is an important type of cyst. Estetocystoma. Look at this term. Estetocystoma. This is developed from the sebaceous duct. If duct is dilated and if it contains some of the secretion, we call that estetocystoma. And pylonidal cyst. Now, many students know this. Where is the common site for pylonidal cyst? Most Where? Of on the rectal side. It is the tail bone. Tail, 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 tail. Okay, good. Yes, yes, Abbas, you are saying something. Yes. Above the needle cliffs sir, in the buttocks area. Exactly. Okay. So Uzair was also saying the same thing. Very good. It is on the, uh, you know, uh, near the coccygeal bone. Okay. We call it lower back. Very near to the gluteal cleft or natal cleft. So around that area, pylonidal sinus and pylonidal cyst may be present. They are hair containing cyst or hair containing sinuses. They can be repeatedly infected and they can lead to a lot of trouble. Because uh, if a person is having infected pylonidal cyst or sinus, you know, the, the person cannot sit properly. There will be a lot of pain in that area. Now, let's talk about another types of cutaneous cyst, and that has a lining of non-stratified squamous epithelium. And the good examples are hydrocystoma. Hydrocystoma. Hydrocystoma means the cyst which is, you know, developed from sweat gland. This is sweat gland.
Now, sweat glands are other important types of gland which open on our skin. Now, they are mainly of two types, eccrine gland and apocrine gland. Now, eccrine gland means these are the type of sweat gland which directly opens on the skin surface. Okay, so they directly open with their duct. They open on the skin surface. So sweat would directly come out on the skin surface. And these are the majority of the uh, sweat gland present on our body. Whereas apocrine gland, okay, it will uh, put its drainage into the hair follicle again. So it would come out through the hair follicle opening. A bit similar to the sebaceous gland. Because sebaceous gland will also do the same thing. But remember, sweat gland secretion and sebaceous gland secretion is very different. Sebaceous gland produces sebum. It is a moisturizing substance. It is an oily substance. Whereas sweat is a watery type of material. Another type of okay, a cutaneous cyst which has a lining of non-stratified squamous epithelium with thyroglossal cyst. Thyroglossal cyst. See here? So it is in connection with thyroglossal duct. So it is, of course, present on the neck area, either above the hyoid bone or below the hyoid bone. There are some very important, uh, you know, characteristic features of thyroglossal cyst. Okay? We'll talk about when we reach that particular area. Branchial cyst is another one which is developing on the side of the neck from the branchial cleft. Now, there are other types of cutaneous cyst where there is no epithelial lining, like mucosil and the ganglion. Mucosil, they are the mucus containing cyst, and mainly present inside the mouth. Okay, mucosil and ganglion. Now, you all know what is ganglion. I think some of the students can answer this. What is ganglion, guys? Sir, Anybody? Sir, sir, collection ganglion, of, sir, sir, collection sir, of cell bodies. Sir. This is formed by the synovium. It is formed by the synovium. Okay. It is formed by the synovium. Uh, I'm getting one answer. And another is, it's a collection of cell body. Both answers are correct. But, okay, please remember which type of topic we are talking right now. We are talking about the cyst. So, this ganglion doesn't mean it's a collection of cell body. But if I ask general question, you can always answer like that, and you are correct. Ganglion is a collection of cell body in peripheral nervous system. Absolutely. But in this situation, we are talking about surgical cyst. So this ganglion is in connection with okay, tendon. Remember, there are some covering of the tendon, which are called synovial sheath. If a cyst is developing through that synovial sheath, we can call that ganglion. It is a very benign, uh, you know, structure, and it may cause a little bit pain, and uh, you know, a little bit discomfort sometimes. And the treatment is surgical removal. With this classification, okay, uh, let's move on. Now, once again, all of the students, please uh, focus on this slide. There are some important, uh, you know knowledge you can gain from here. Please see that. Now, we already talked about okay, this structure actually. This is a hair follicle, you can clearly see. This is a schematic diagram, but very good and informative one. This is called root of the hair or bulb of the hair. So from the infundibulum, of this hair follicle, these are the structures or these are the type of cyst which develop. Epidermoid cyst, also known as sebaceous cyst, milium, pigmented follicular cyst, and vellus hair cyst. Now, this vellus hair is a very immature or early type of hair, or you can also call this as a baby hair. Before the period of, okay, uh, puberty in a childhood period, the hair which is present on our body, especially on the body, okay, not on the skull, the body is called vellus hair. So, this is the meaning. 
from outer root shape we have trichy lamel cyst so it is present from the outer root sheath of the hair follicle exactly from this structure and from the sebaceous duct uh, there is steto schistoma steto schistoma uh, this is the sebaceous gland this is the sebaceous duct this is sebaceous gland on the other side these are the different parts of the hair follicle see this in fundibulum on the top isthmus in the middle and inferior portion this is also known as bulb now with this let's enter into the discussion of sebaceous cyst also known as epidermal cyst and it has got uh, many different synonyms some of them are epidermoid inclusion cyst epidermal cyst epidermal inclusion cyst and infundibular cyst as well but most commonly used two important synonyms are sebaceous cyst or epidermal cyst it is the most common types of cutaneous cyst on our body and the tiny or very small type of superficial sebaceous or epidermal cyst are known as milia we already talked about inside the milia there is a deposition of keratin keratin is a type of protein which is present by or which is produced by keratinocyte keratinocytes are cells of the epidermal area let me repeat again keratin is a type of protein which is present inside the milia this keratin or keratin protein is uh, produced by keratinocyte and these keratinocytes are known as epithelial cells of epidermis remember this now look, look at this uh, schematic uh, diagram once again where is the sebaceous cyst shown here See this? This is okay. Uh, the area of the sebaceous cyst. This is sebaceous cyst. And this is a hair follicle. This is also connected with the hair follicle. Now let's talk about how it how it is formed. What is the pathogenesis? It is derived from the follicular infundibular area. They may be primary, but they may arise from the disrupted. follicular structure or sometime they are traumatically implanted epithelium as well that's why they are also known as inclusion cyst so what do you mean by that there is a trauma in this area for example and this uh, you know a follicular infundibulum epithelium is implanted somewhere deeper and that structure can also develop inclusion cyst this is a type of or part of epidermoid or sebaceous cyst sebaceous cyst or epidermoid cyst is due to occlusion of the mouth of hair follicle by epithelial debris or sebum giving rise to a retention cyst of sebaceous gland Now let me again uh, take you back to the same uh, you know picture so all of you Uh, please focus here so where is the opening of the hair follicle it is right here this area somehow if this opening is blocked and how it is blocked that is an important question to be asked remember many of us are having a lot of flaking formation on our skin these are called skin flakes okay so those skin flakes will block the opening of hair follicle now this a sebaceous duct will open into the hair follicle and through the opening of it 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 comes outside on the surface of the skin so if this is blocked then the sebum cannot come outside so this sebum will be collected here in this area this is called infundibular okay part of the hair follicle and then it will develop into the sebaceous cyst that's why it is a type of retention cyst means the secretions are retained inside the area now see this this results from the inflammation of pilosebaceous follicle and many of the time 
the person is also having acne. Now, acne is an important term in dermatology. I'm sure you, you have heard this term before. Acne, okay, it is quite common in pubertal age, very common in pubertal age, okay, in both sexes, both male and female. Androgen plays a big role in the formation of acne. And why I'm bringing this point, it is also related with the disease of this pilosebaceous unit. Pilo is the term for hair follicle. Sebaceous is the term for sebaceous gland. So if that hair follicle is blocked, it can also result in acne disease. Now the common site of a sebaceous star, hairy part of the body, there has to be hair follicle, remember that. So scalp, neck, face, shoulder area, chest, anterior part of the chest, scrotum, and thigh. So these all are hairy part of the body. Scalp, neck, face, shoulder, chest, scrotum, and upper part of the thigh. So these all are quite common site for sebaceous gland formation. Now, what are the clinical features of epidermoid cyst or sebaceous cyst? So let's go slowly because this is an important question, especially from the general surgery part. Sebaceous cyst may be single or maybe multiple. But sometimes there are many, numerous sebaceous cysts in the same area. Regarding the site, it can occur anywhere on the body but only rarely on the soles and the palm, okay? Very rarely on the soles and the palm. And especially if they are present on the soles and the palm, they occur as a result of implantation. Means some of the epithelium is driven or forced inside in a deeper area. And from there, a uh, sebaceous cyst may originate, but that is very rare. So just now we talked about the most common locations are the trunk, the neck, face, and the skull. Uh, in case of male, even the scrotum. Usually, it is quite smooth and touch. It is spherical, a rounded, a dome-shaped lesion, and it is soft to form a touch. Soft to form, dome-shaped. This is a shape, okay? It's spherical, rounded, and smooth on palpation. The central part of the swelling is fixed to skin. That's why, okay, it is shown in a bold letter because this is an important point. The central part of the swelling is fixed to the skin. So I cannot pinch the skin from the surface of the cyst. It is covered with normal epidermis and that normal epidermis is lined with stratified squamous epithelium, okay? Stratified squamous epithelium. Now, let me ask you one question because I, I, I am sure uh, you already know this, but still, what is stratified squamous epithelium? What do you mean by that? Yes? What is stratified means? Uh, uh, sir, it consists of sir, the squamous, sir, the flattened epithelial cell arranged in layer, sir. Absolutely, absolutely, okay? I just want to hear that. Stratified means layer. They are different layer. Squamous epithelium means flattened epithelium. So these epithelia are arranged in a different layer, more than one layer. That is the meaning. And stratified squamous epithelium is of two types, keratinized and non-keratinized. If they are having keratin at the surface, Call this keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, like in the skin. And in some other area, they are not having any keratin. It may appear yellow or white if superficial. So this is a little regarding a bit of color. Indentation test is positive because this is a semi-solid debris inside that, that collection, that sebum, okay, will uh, make this indentation test positive. And Regarding the punctum, okay, punctum is a small structure which is present at the central part. And this punctum occurs at the blocked duct because uh, the, the hair follicle 
if it is you know blocked there uh, that area present as a punctum so it may be visible in the center in almost 70% of the cases i have collected few of the uh, pictures from the internet site the different internet site and different books okay so you can see this later on now the cyst may discharge a creamy material and this may dry in the center to form a horn this is a very typical you know characteristic feature especially on the scalp we'll talk about that if it takes a longer time and if it comes out slowly remember that uh, you know discharge will dry up and it will almost form a horn like structure there this is known as sebaceous horn and this is also one of the typical feature of a sebaceous cyst Let's move on. Let's see uh, some of the picture and try to make our concept quite clear. So we look here. Let's let's focus on this part. This is a very large size epidermal cyst. Look how huge it is. This is the margin of the cyst. Okay, and uh, if we press on any area here. indentation test is positive but let me ask you one question what about the trans illumination test in this type of cyst whether it will be positive or negative mm, negative negative sir negative sir exactly it's always negative it is always negative because there is no clear fluid inside okay so trans illumination test is negative but indentation test is positive and fluctuation test is also positive now see this if we squeeze if we squeeze this then some of the discharge may be forced to come out okay forced to come out this is keratin which is mixed along with sebum and this is the you know big puncta which is present in the middle and because this mass is a bit of smaller than this this is a clear cut puncta or punctum we can say singular is called punctum plural is called puncta okay so it is it is nicely seen now another one look at this area this is a very spherical type of mass okay uh, which is uh, present in the epigastric region and in this portion it is present there for more than 10 years duration and you can see still see the punctum here this structure is called punctum in the central part of the cyst and because of this it is very easy for us to diagnose and we can confirm yes this looks like a sebaceous cyst if we uh, put a needle inside the sebaceous cyst and aspirate it okay so we are talking about a different clinical features of a okay. different clinical features of sebaceous cyst now one of the important point in the sebaceous cyst when you examine is there is a punctum at the center it looks a bit of a black in color and this uh, signify this is the opening of the you know uh, that uh, duct uh, which is blocked and all the problem started after blockage of the duct let's move on sometimes the sebaceous cyst can get rupture okay it can get rupture and after it gets rupture there will be inflammatory reaction in that ruptured area and this is a very painful condition and after the rupture so many of the patient they come to the hospital because they cannot bear the pain before that they think it is a very minor type of problem you know so they take it very lightly but after uh, it ruptures there is a serious inflammation there may be secondary infection and they definitely come to the physician and that's when the disease is diagnosed rupture is followed by foreign body reaction to the keratin which is excreted outside and it can lead to acute inflammatory reaction now uh, please uh, uh, focus here in this picture here is a inflamed sebaceous cyst look at the features of inflammation here there is redness 
okay, there is a bit of swelling. Swelling is already there, but after the inflammation occurs, the swelling is even more. So this is inflamed epidermal cyst. Now, this is a typical clinical appearance of the epidermoid cyst. Now, every student, please make this picture, okay, or take this picture on your mind. This is a swelling, and at the center of the swelling, there is a punctum, which usually is black in color. And if it is a chronic type of uh, cyst, then there may be some secondary changes as well, like some blood vessels may be formed on the surface. This is the punctum of sebaceous gland. Okay, right there. It's a dark color keratin plug overlying the cyst cavity. And this is a very important take home message from this class. Now, sometime if epidermal, uh, epidermoid cyst or sebaceous cyst is there for a long period of time, then it may develop into BCC or SCC. Now, what is the full form of this? BCC and SCC? Exactly. Okay, we talked about this. Basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma. They are the skin malignancy. BCC is the most common skin malignancy followed by squamous cell carcinoma. This is a very rare event, but it can happen. Multiple epidermoid cysts may occur in some of the setting, like if the person is having extensive acne vulgaris. Now, acne vulgaris is an acne disease, which is very common during the pubertal time. I already told you. So if somebody is having acne vulgaris, then the same person may be having a lot of sebaceous cysts as well. The pathophysiology of both these conditions okay, are quite similar. In both this situation, there is blockage of the opening of hair follicle, then the problem start. Multiple scrotal cyst may lead to scrotal calcinosis via the dystrophic calcification. A scrotum is one of the common site for sebaceous cyst formation, and usually there would be multiple scrotal cyst development there. And later on, this scrotal cyst may calcify. This is an example of dystrophic calcification. Now, tell me, what is the meaning of dystrophic calcification? Anybody? What is dystrophic calcification? Sir, uh, sir dystrophic calcification, there is calcification there is of that. Generated on necrotic tissue, which are, which are some scars, hyaline scars are there. Okay. Yes, uh, Ujair, you are right. Yes, Irfan, you are saying? Sir, the calcium level is normal in the body and calcification uh, in the deep tissue, sir. Good, Abbas, very good. So see there, the answer is coming. Excellent. Dystrophic calcification occurs in the dead and diseased tissue. Dead and diseased tissue where the overall calcium level in the blood is normal, but still it gets deposited in those dead or devitalized tissue. This is known as dystrophic calcification. Now, you got the meaning, okay? So this is a deposition of calcium or we call it calcification, calcification in dead or diseased tissue. Another is Gardner syndrome. This is familial adenomatous polyposis. You have studied this in pathology. Okay. Yes. In this condition, uh, you know, after the age of 40, 100% of the patient develops colon cancer. Familial adenomatous polyposis. Uh, uh, one of the, you know, familial condition is known as Gardner syndrome. And that is also commonly associated with multiple uh, uh, sebaceous cysts on the body. Let's move on. Now, let's, let's look at uh, some of the picture here. See this? These are the multiple sebaceous cysts. Uh, this is a scrotum. Look at, even we cannot count it. These are innumerable uh, epidermal cysts, sebaceous cysts on the scrotum. 
Now, if you take a biopsy from the sebaceous cyst, then what is the finding? What is the histopathology examination? There is a cavity, definitely, because this is a cyst, so cavity would be there, and it is filled with keratin, that is lamellated keratin in a different layer, lined by a flattened stratified squamous epithelium with a granular layer in it. Okay? So stratified squamous epithelium with a granular layer. The stratum granulosum it is called. We already uh, talked about the classification of sebaceous cyst. So these are the cutaneous cysts which are lined by stratified squamous epithelium. So here is the evidence for you. And they, have, they are having a keratin substance inside as well as sebum. A surrounding inflammatory response with both acute and chronic granulomatous inflammation may be seen as evidence of prior rupture and that can result with scarring. So it depends how old is the sebaceous cyst and whether it is intact or ruptured. If it ruptures, it leads to inflammation and in chronic type of inflammation, we call it granulomatous inflammation. So all those are different things may be there. See this? Okay, this is another picture uh, which is uh, showing the same thing. This is lamellated uh, keratin, and here is stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, both things are there. Now, another uh, you know histopathological picture showing layer by layer. So, this is the lamellated keratin right at the center of the cyst. This is the wall of the cyst which is having stratified squamous epithelium with a granular layer and these are other parts of the epithelial layer so epidermoid cyst now when we palpate the sebaceous cyst okay two of the important point this is a very favorite question of the examiner and these are indentation test positive and fluctuation test positive never forget this trans illumination test is negative And uh, sometimes if we squeeze a little bit harder, okay, some of the content may come out from the center of the lesion as well, from the punctum, the contents may be coming out and that will even confirm the diagnosis. Now please focus here. So this is a sebaceous cyst on the face, okay, and on the scalp face and the skull. Note the hair loss on the skin over the cyst. Okay, there's no hair. In other, other uh, part, there will be hair growth, but here there is no, no hair growth. And sebaceous cyst in the face is a bit of infected. I cannot clearly see it. It is rather a better examined than observed. But if it is infected, how you know during examination, or palpation that it is infected? Yes. What finding would be there? Sir, any pus and any sign of inflammation, redness? Exactly. Exactly. This is a very easy question, but very important one. Okay. Don't forget the signs of inflammation, redness. Okay. More swelling than before. Tenderness or pain. Isn't it? Heat. If you palpate there, it will feel hot. All the classical features of inflammation will be there. On top of that, a pus may come out if you squeeze a little bit harder. So these all uh, things may be there if it is infected. What are the differential diagnosis of sebaceous cyst? In other words, what are the other structure uh, uh, for which we confuse that with sebaceous cyst? One of the common skin condition is known as lipoma. Okay, lipoma. See this. This lipoma, okay, is a tumor. This is a benign tumor which is developed from fat cells or adipose tissue. Now, this sebaceous cyst is not a lipoma because it has this this uh, you know a classical finding. So this is the way you can defend yourself. Sebaceous cyst is not lobulated, 
whereas lipoma is lobulated structure lobulated means it has got different lobules which are separated by septa slipping sign is not positive in sebaceous cyst whereas lipoma is a slipping type of mass it's a mass actually it's a solid structure in sebaceous cyst there is a punctum present at the center and if we squeeze a little bit harder some material would come out and indentation test is positive in sebaceous cyst which is absent in lipoma so these are the different types of answer you can give another important differential diagnosis is fibroma fibroma is another benign tumor which develops from fibrous tissue now see this sebaceous cyst is a soft structure whereas fibroma is a little bit formed to hard another is a dermoid cyst now dermoid cyst is another type of cyst which may develop on the skin and subcutaneous tissue it is mainly present on the embryological fusion site if two important embryological structures are fusing with each other like in the midline okay then dermoid cyst may originate there but sebaceous cyst doesn't have that type of characteristic feature and there is a presence of punctum so if you if you analyze this slide you know because of this punctum sebaceous cyst cannot be missed so punctum is one of the very very important clinical clue to identify yes this is a case of sebaceous cyst and other things are already there now what complication can happen uh, in sebaceous cyst see this one of the complication we already talked about is inflammation and infection inflammation occurs if there is a rupture of the sebaceous cyst because the material which is collected inside is a highly you know inflammatory substance and this is a painful condition as well can you see here okay so one is inflammation another is infection and that infection can result in abscess formation and this is a very painful situation this infection and abscess formation particularly occurs on the face and neck area in association with acne vulgaris now acne okay uh, is a disorder of pilo sebaceous unit it is very common in face as well as upper back as upper chest also now in acne first of all what happens there is obstruction of the hair follicle and later on there is retention of the sebum or sebaceous substance inside the sebaceous gland the sebaceous gland will become bigger in size and later on they will be infected one of the common bacteria which uh, is involved in acne vulgaris anybody know the name of that bacteria which which the is propionobacterium acnes very good pro p o n e bacterium acne okay let me write that name for you pro p o n e bacterium acne now this uh, is a normal commensal which is already present there and in this type of situation this bacteria can enter inside the sebaceous you know distended type of sebaceous gland and can lead to severe infection there that is known as acne vulgaris now you may be wondering what is the meaning of vulgaris term here vulgaris means common okay common type of acne is called acne vulgaris very very common during pubertal age group both aerobic and anaerobic organisms are commonly isolated from the infection of sebaceous gland now, another type of complication is calcification and formation of sebaceous horn we already talked about this if the material which is collected inside the sebaceous gland is slowly release outside okay it will dried up there and it may lead to sebaceous horn formation and very rarely it may turn into malignancy as well but that is quite rare now let's see uh, some of the pictures now, all of you 
please focus here. See this? This is called sebaceous horn. Look here. Okay. This is a typical appearance. It looks like a horny, horny appearance. That's why we call it sebaceous horn. And it will develop only when the sebum slowly discharges from the punctum and it gets dried up there. Multiple sebaceous cysts are associated with Gardner syndrome, and Gardner syndrome is having a uh, multiple okay adenomatous polyps inside the colon and this is known as precancerous condition so you can clearly see here okay so probably this patient may be having gardner syndrome and to diagnose gardner syndrome we need to do colonoscopy we need to confirm uh, those multiple uh, colonic polyp inside the colon Now, there is one very peculiar uh, type of condition or very interesting condition, okay, which is considered one of the complications of sebaceous cyst that is known as Cox peculiar tumor. Okay, Cox peculiar tumor. Now, let's talk about it. What is this? Here, the surface of the sebaceous cyst gets ulcerated which leads to formation of painful fungating mass. Now, fungating mass means it is growing outwards, okay? Fungating mass with a lot of discharge. And this discharge, especially having sebum, okay? The discharge is having sebum along with some keratin substance. So this typical appearance which is seen is known as Cox peculiar tumor. It often resembles epithelioma. Now, what is epithelioma? We talked about this before. What is epithelioma? Anyone? Growth of the epithelium. Growth of the epithelium. Okay. Any other answer? Now, epithelioma. Sir, it's a malignant growth. Very good. It's a malignant type of tumor. It is just another name for squamous cell carcinoma. It is another term for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, epithelioma. Don't forget. So, Cox peculiar tumor just resembles or looks like epithelioma, but when we take the biopsy from the surface, okay, we rule out this is not a case of squamous cell carcinoma. It is a misnomer. Definitely, okay. It is a misnomer as it is not a tumor. It is a chronic granuloma or an ulcerated surface of the sebaceous cyst. You can clearly see here. These are some of the lobulated structure. Okay, it's a fungating type of mass. There are some ulceration on the surface, and with one look. Uh, we are almost confused. Oh, this looks like a malignant a tumor there, but actually it is not a malignancy. It is an infected, open, granulating edematous sebaceous cyst, and it is not a tumor. And the treatment is we have to resect it quite well, and it will be all right. Now, okay, so finally, how we treat. This epidermoid cyst or sebaceous cyst. Now, see there, there are different you know, types of management. So, let's talk about them in detail. The first thing is assurance or reassurance, we can say. If there are small cysts which are less than 5 millimeter, you don't usually need treatment. So, you can assure the patient these are very harmless type of you know, or things there on your body. So even if you do not go for the treatment, nothing will happen. And these are type of suggestion we give if they are very small. Another type of treatment is surgical excision. Now you have to completely remove that mass. Okay, this is done by simple excision, or you can first incise at the center of the mass and express all the contents first. Okay, 
and then remove the wall. So there are different way by which we can remove the mass. One is simple excision. Excision means total removal. The whole mass is removed at once. Second, uh, you know, way is first we incise it. We open that area. We scoop all the cis substance, and then uh, we remove the wall. And remember, always this is a surgical principle. After you do this type of surgery, send that substance for histopathological exam. If the entire cyst wall is not removed, the cyst may recur. Okay, remember the meaning of implantation cyst. That is the meaning. So if something is left behind in the deeper area, the cyst may recur. Cysts are more difficult to remove once they have ruptured because there is intense uh, intensive inflammation later on. Okay. See there. When there is inflamed epidermoid cyst or inflamed sebaceous cyst, now how we manage them? Now during the active inflammation, it is best to avoid surgery. Now why is that? Okay, this is a very important question which is asked by your surgical teacher. Why we avoid surgery? If there is active infection and inflammation, why? Anyone? Sir, because you may become self infection. Sir, risk of infections. The risk of in infection can be increased. Exactly. Exactly. We all are right. I will strip the organ. Exactly. You, are, you all are right. It is clearly written here. See that? There is a higher risk of infection. There is higher risk of wound dehiscence and recurrence of the cyst. The most important one is higher risk of infection. Till now, it is just inflamed. But if you do surgery at this time, there is a high chance of introduction of infection there. And you may turn that thing into an infected area. Another thing, you may suture that uh, inflamed or infected area, okay, uh, and that wound will give away the wound will break down, the suture will separate. This is called wound dehiscence. That is quite common if we do surgery in the inflamed area. That's why first let's allow the inflammation and infection to settle, then only uh, plan for surgery later on. This is a very important surgical principle anywhere on the body. So incision and drainage may need to be done first. Antibiotic therapy is occasionally required if you think infection has already occurred. And then intralesional triamcinolone may be helpful. Now, what is triamcinolone? What type of drug is this? What type of drug? Triamcinolone. Exactly. Okay. I'm sure many other students also know this. This is a type of corticosteroid. Triamcinolone. This is an injectable form of corticosteroid and uh, it may uh, help to decrease the inflammation there. Sir, it is used in estomine COPD. You are right. It has so many other indications. Okay, Corticosteroids are very commonly used in so many different conditions. So let's not go into that part now. Otherwise, we'll deviate from our main discussion. Now, let's talk about how to remove the sebaceous cyst surgically. Okay, because this is a surgical class, so you need to know a bit about that as well. So there is a puncta right at the center. Okay, and this is the wall. So what we do now, injection of a local anesthetic all around. Otherwise, there will be severe pain during this type of surgery. Then you give an elliptical incision with a scalpel. This is called elliptical incision. Now see this. So you widely open that part and then okay, you scoop everything outside. You scoop everything or remove the contents as well as the wall. Remove the contents as well as the wall. Now there are two things. Sometimes the surgeon remove everything together. 
both the contents as well as the wall together. The whole mass is removed together. And some other time, they just open it, remove the uh, contents, and then the leftover wall is removed. And uh, later on, see this, the suture is applied there. So where is the mass now? It is no more. We have just removed that. Now, this is the same, uh, you know, similar type of procedure okay, so shown in a real patient. See this, this is a severe cyst, which is seen here. Okay, this is an elliptical type of incision so given. You have opened up the mass, okay, you squeeze the material, remove it completely, and then suture it. Now, when we completely remove it, look at the macroscopic appearance of a resected cyst here. So this is a dried up, you know, substance, a little bit organized type of substance inside. And if they ask you, what is the substance that is present inside the severe cyst? The answer is very easy. It is sebum as well as keratin. Sebum as well as keratin. Now see this, there is a cyst here on the upper eyelid, okay? There is a cyst and then it is removed, okay? It has been removed. So this is how it looks. Now we have got a few minutes left and let's talk about another very important type of cyst, very commonly asked in the exam along with severe cyst, cyst that is thyroglossal cyst. Now, before I go into the discussion of this cyst, this particular cyst, I want to tell something about development of thyroid gland first. It is written here actually. Now, all of you, please pay attention here. The thyroid gland is one of the very important type of endocrine gland in our body. This develops from the lower portion of the thyroglossal duct. And from where this thyroglossal duct starts its journey, it starts from foramen cecum, which is present near to the base of the tongue. To be very precise, this foramen cecum is the junction of anterior two-third of the tongue and posterior one-third of the tongue. It is present right there. Anterior two-third of the tongue and posterior one-third of the tongue. Remember, this is a very important you know, division of the tongue. There are so many important you know, uh, questions we can ask simply from the tongue itself. Now, foramen cecum is there. And from that foramen cecum area, one small duct starts to go downwards or distally. And this is known as thyroglossal duct. Now, thyro is the term for thyroid gland. Glossal is the term for tongue. That's why it's very easy to remember. Now this duct will slowly and slowly grows downward and it goes uh, distal to the hyoid bone which is present on the anterior side of the neck and then when it reaches to the present thyroid gland you know uh, near that area it will bifurcate into the two parts and each of these parts will develop into the individual thyroid lobe because thyroid gland has got two lobes, right lobe and the left lobe. And the connector, what is the connector substance in thyroid gland called? What we call that? Isthmus, okay? This is called isthmus. So two lobes of the thyroid and the isthmus, all of these are developed from thyroglossal duct. Now, let's come to the topic. This thyroglossal duct, okay, has to completely disappear after the thyroid gland is developed. Now, sometimes what happens? Because of some embryological okay, abnormality or developmental abnormality, some part of this thyroglossal duct is still stays behind. Okay, it, it, it doesn't completely disappear. And that part develops into the thyroglossal cyst. So this is the embryological description how this thyroglossal cyst develops. Now, where are these cysts now? See this? The cysts are usually found between the isthmus 
of the thyroid gland isthmus means connectors of part of the two lobes of the thyroid gland and the hyoid bone or it is present just above the hyoid bone so it may be present in any of these area below the hyoid bone or above the hyoid bone they occur at any age but the majority of them are seen in the patient between the age of 15 and 30 years of age it is present in quite young people now how to diagnose them isn't it that's the main question now see here what are the clinical features of thyroglossal cyst now the presentation is usually as a painless smooth cystic midline swelling in the region of the hyoid bone exactly at the region of the hyoid bone or it may be slightly above or below the hyoid bone as well so see this this is a painless smooth cystic midline swelling in the region of the hyoid bone very important point and it becomes symptomatic if it becomes inflamed and it will cause pain and swelling in case of inflammation the swelling is already there i'm not saying this because the cyst cyst is a type of swelling but that swelling will be further more in case of inflammation and infection now if your examiner asks how do you confirm that this is a thyroglossal cyst and this answer has to be given okay all of you please pay attention here when we ask the patient to protrude their tongue outside okay the cyst will go up the cyst will rises up or go up or when we ask the patient to swallow okay or drink some fluid or swallow some food then also the cyst will move up now the important point here is why does it happen like that because let's let's think about the embryological derivative again from where this cyst has been originated from the thyroglossal duct and thyroglossal duct has a connection with foramen cecum which is a part of the tongue that's why if the patient protrude their tongue forward this duct is also pulled up as a result of this the cyst will also moves up this is absolutely important and diagnostic test or examination we can do in case of thyroglossal cyst never forget it now uh, all of you please focus on this picture for a moment of time see that please so here is the tongue okay here is the tongue there is the foramen cecum you can see foramen cecum this area so from there the thyroglossal uh, duct okay the journey of thyroglossal duct starts so it will descend uh, inferiorly so this is a hyoid bone above the hyoid is called suprahyoid okay below the hyoid is called infrahyoid so thyroglossal cyst can be above the hyoid bone or can be below the hyoid bone and this is the normal site for a thyroid gland see this this is thyroid gland we are looking from the lateral side sometimes uh, the complete disappearance of this uh, thyroglossal duct may not happen so there is presence of the thyroglossal cyst in this area any any of this area can have thyroglossal cyst but importantly it is near to the hyoid bone it has all the features of cyst all the features that is smooth spherical trans uh, sorry the fluctuation test is positive but trans illumination test it depends what is the uh, what type of fluid is present inside usually it is positive here because the fluid is usually serous in nature and uh, this is how it looks in a real patient see this exactly in the midline okay this is a cyst and you confirm whether this is a cyst or this is a solid mass by doing those test which i just told you perform the fluctuation test here perform trans illumination test 
okay so those tests will be positive so and one important point ask the patient to stick out the tongue and when the person stick out the tongue if the mass moves upward this is almost a diagnostic feature of thyroglossal cyst and no doubt is left whatsoever cutaneous dermoid cyst typically present in an infant along an embryonic fusion plane as a discrete subcutaneous nodule so this is subcutaneous nodule it 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 acts like a mass but actually when we uh, examine that mass it is a cyst it has fluid inside the contents is fluid or semi solid material and one important point here it is formed in those areas where there is embryonic fusion you see this this is important point regarding dermal cyst embryonic fusion the two two important types of tissues are you know fused with each other and during that plane uh, you know or in that plane dermal cyst will be formed it results from sequestration of ectodermal tissue along those embryonic fusion plane during the development sequestration means those ectodermal tissue will be hidden there okay they will be hidden underneath other tissues probably but they are ectoderm and they may develop into the dermoid cyst now how i correlate the thing see this dermoid derma is a part of the skin dermis and this ectoderm is the source of skin development so this is a you know a simple way of correlation although dermal cysts are congenital defect and may be recognized at birth sometimes they may appear later on they may simply be diagnosed later on but they were present probably from the time of birth but not identified during that time and another reason is later on they may get bigger they may get infected or inflamed and that's how they are easy to diagnose sometimes they are diagnosed in early childhood as well dermal cyst can occur in other parts of the body also right now we are talking about cutaneous dermoid cyst but they can occur in other parts of the body like in the skull in the spine spine means vertebra or inside the abdominal cavity particularly in the ovaries ovaries are a very common site for dermoid cyst development some sometimes the dermoid cysts are called teratomatous cyst also okay and if they occur they can occur people of any ages and any sex uh, if they occur in these specific areas let's move on okay now see here so the point which i was giving a lot of stress the site of embryonic fusion or embryologic fusion now see here these areas okay the midline okay uh, this uh, lateral canthus of the eye this is called medial canthus of the eye this is called lateral canthus of the eye near the lateral canthus midline of the face okay this is the excellent picture which is showing a mass is present near the lateral canthus of the eye and this is an example of dermal cyst is another one see here this cyst just focus here now let me point this one now this dermoid cyst presented in an infant as a form subcutaneous nodule superior to the lateral left eyebrow so this is the eyebrow here and this is present superior aspect of the eyebrow on the lateral side this is the mass we are talking about it presents as a form nodule but it may have some features of the cyst this is another one see here is a typical dermoid cyst now how i suspect this as a dermoid cyst because of its position because of the site where it is developed this is a typical site for dermoid cyst development let's classify it this dermoid cyst is lined by squamous epithelium definitely because this is the epithelium 
a miskin and the contents of the dermoid cyst are mixture of sweat sebum disquamated epithelial cells and even the hair now sweat is produced by sweat gland sebum is produced by sebaceous gland and both of these are part of the dermis so this is the way we can correlate the things so these are contents of the cutaneous dermoid cyst okay that's what we are talking right now but there is another type of dermoid cyst which is known as teratomatous dermoid cyst see this teratomatous dermoid cyst it's a type of teratoma now teratoma means all three germ layer may be there and the tissue which are derived from those three germ layer may be present what are those three germ layer i'm talking here what are those as yes. ectoderm mesoderm endoderm endoderm exactly ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm so the structure of the tissue which can develop from those three germ layer may be present inside the teratomatous dermoid in case of cutaneous dermoid only the you know derivative of the skin may be present okay remember that this teratomatous dermoid may occur in ovary in testes in the retroperitoneal area inside the abdominal cavity even in the mediastinum the superior part of mediastinum and in case of some of the babies it may be present in presacral area also okay we call it sacrococcygeal teratoma sacrococcygeal teratoma it may be present in some of the baby in the newborn babies sometime they may undergo into malignant change now remember there are different types of tissues present inside the teratomas dermoid so if epithelial component develop malignant change we call them carcinoma and if connective tissue develop into malignancy we call them sarcoma i'm sure every student know the difference carcinoma versus sarcoma if epithelial tissue develop into malignancy carcinoma like stomach carcinoma okay so facial cell carcinoma for example bladder cell carcinoma isn't it very easy but sarcoma okay can you give one or two example of sarcoma anybody which tissues we we name sarcoma like rhabdomyosarcoma because osteosarcoma sarcoma. exactly osteosarcoma excellent sarcoma. exactly lymphosarcoma okay osteosarcoma chondrosarcoma see this rhabdomyosarcoma leiomyosarcoma angiosarcoma so just think about connective tissue here connective tissue when they develop into malignant form we call them sarcoma don't mix the things together okay this shows your basic is quite poor if you do that now let's move on another type of dermoid is a congenital dermoid this is very common and these are the common site for the development of congenital dermoid cyst like near the outer canthus of the eye the picture which you have seen just now is of this type all of those were developing and near to the outer canthus of the eye is also known as external angular dermoid it may develop at the root of the nose it may develop in any part of the midline of the body because that is the fusion site and it may develop in front of the ear which is pre auricular or behind the ear that is post auricular so these are some of the important site for the development of congenital dermoid now the third variety is known as implantation dermoid you see there now the meaning of implantation is the skin is driven inside the skin is driven inside so there are two layers of the skin epidermis and dermis so when they are driven deeper into the tissue by some of the penetrating wound then from that you know driven skin the cyst is developed and we call that implantation dermoid so they are usually developed in those people who who repeatedly get injury 
in their finger or toes okay like farmer farmer are the perfect example here so the common sight are fingers and the toes these are implantation dermal Okay, so let's move on. Let's talk about some of the clinical features now. Regarding the congenital or sequestration dermoid, in these uh, you know uh, two things together, the common site already discussed so many times along the lines of embryonic fusion that is in the midline of the body or the face. This is common. Now, uh, what are the how they are formed? See this. Okay, on the face, and let's talk about the formation of this. The dermal cells, which are sequestrated in the subcutaneous plane, now they proliferate first, and over the period of time they liquefy there. Sometimes they simply, you know, collect the secretion of the different glands there, like sweat gland may be there, sebaceous gland may be there. Some of the hairs may fall there, and all those things liquefy together, and this may act as a content of the cyst. it grows deeper and by doing so it indent or give pressure okay to the mesoderm and remember this mesoderm will form or develop into the bone because bones are the mesodermal derivative so one of the very very important point you should never forget after this class when we talk about dermoid cyst uh, if it is a deeper one there may be constant pressure on the underlying bone and there may be bony defect already present this is because of constant pressure first of the mesoderm and the same mesoderm will develop into the bone so there may be slight indentation or depression on the surface of the bone as a result of dermal cyst so this is the dermal cyst you can clearly see here is the pinna or the auricle so this is known as post auricular dermoid okay post auricular dermoid now what are the clinical features so most of the things we have already talked so they just list them okay in the slides they present as a foam non compressible as well as compressible both can be there sometimes they are a little bit firm or hard you know so they are not compressible but they are having a fluid or semi solid contents inside so they are still the cyst and if they are they are having good amount of fluid inside then they are compressible they are non pulsatile subcutaneous nodule that often reach a size of 1 to 4 cm in diameter now which mass is pulsatile in nature which mass anybody aneurysm excellent this this is aneurysm okay and you all know what is aneurysm right aneurysm develops from the arterial wall so because of that they are pulsatile and sometimes listen pay attention here sometimes what happens the mass is right in front of the artery or right above the artery and during that time also a bit of pulsatile mass may be present but that is not a true pulsatile mass we can easily differentiate it from the aneurysm the lesions are not illuminating type means they do not trans illuminate because of the contents they should have a clear content then only there is trans illumination test positive but in this type they are negative they are most commonly located around the eye particularly the lateral eyebrow but may also occur anywhere in the body like in the nose mainly in the central part scalp okay scalp maybe in the occiput at the back side of the head maybe in the neck maybe in the sternum maybe in the sacrum and maybe in the scrotum so if you analyze you know many of these places are either the embryological fusion area or they are in the midline they can be associated with a nearby pit or sinus track to the underlying tissue they may be quite deeper and they may be connected with the different sinuses 
one of the important point if dermoid cyst occurs in the face area like on the nose or midline part of the skull they may have intracranial extension as well okay intracranial extension now, what is the danger if they are extended intracranially what is the danger anybody compress the brain parenchyma or increase the intracranial pressure because in that okay now one thing is if they are infected the infection can easily enter into the intracranial cavity that is first one and during the removal remember during the excision or the removal you do not blindly pull it because they may be attached to some of the intracranial structure and that may be quite damaging so we need to be quite sure about this we need to rule out whether there is intracranial extension or not then only the proper treatment should be provided now let's continue the clinical features of dermoid cyst it may manifest during childhood or adolescence it is typically a painless slow growing swelling there is no pain here until and unless it is infected there is no pain now the classical features of the cyst are present they may be soft they may be cystic or fluctuant type of swelling and they yield to pressure of finger that means indentation test is also positive this is fluctuation this is indentation this is a cyst but remember not 100% of the dermoid cyst are fluctuant in nature sometimes they are quite firm to hard as well trans illumination test is negative there is no impulse on coughing why we are doing this test impulse on cough which type of masses okay they there is impulse on coughing anybody which hernia okay hernia if they are present on our body surface then when we put a finger there and ask the patient to cough we can feel the hernia is bulging there this is called impulse on coughing sometimes these are dermoid cyst may be confused with hernia as well just to separate or differentiate hernia from dermoid cyst we are doing this type of test this is important one there is underlying bony defect this is a very important clue for the diagnosis and let me explain once again remember dermoid cyst is originated from epidermis but it may be deeper sometimes in in the deeper plane of the body it may give constant pressure to the mesoderm and that mesoderm will develop into the bone so because of that constant pressure there is indentation forms on the surface of the bone and that is clue for our diagnosis we can see that uh, in the x ray another important clinical feature or clue for the diagnosis is they are usually present along the line of fusion or in the midline now all of you please focus on this slide what can you see here okay see there please it is written here this is ovarian cyst and uh, look at how big is the cyst there okay this is a cyst and what can you see here what is inside that cyst they have cut it open what what can they see here hairs see this these are the hairs and this is a very thick wall other tissues are not shown properly but lots of hairs are present inside the dermoid cyst so this is a type of dermoid cyst present inside the ovary it may be teratoma sometimes now let's talk a little bit about implantation dermoid the meaning you already know implantation means the skin is driven inside especially in the fingers and toes or in the extremities and they are mainly uh, you know uh, found in uh, those people who has a particular type of job 
or the work like in ladies or women who are you know household workers tailors agriculturists and the farmers who repeatedly sustain minor injuries on their fingers and toes along with palms and sole so at those site implantation dermoid may be present and one of the important clinical feature of this is it is hard in consistency now why it is hard because of the skin which is present there that skin is very thick now why this skin is thick anybody can tell me why this skin is thick i in the last class i i told you how many layers are present in the epidermis i want i want to hear that answer again how many layers are present in the epidermis yes four four or five isn't it four or five in the thin skin, five, 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 in the, six, the thin skin there are four in thick skin there are five now this is a thick skin i am talking about right now palm and sole and why it is a thick skin which one layer is extra here i am going to write only the name of that layer okay that is called stratum lucidum stratum lucidum this is extra layer in the epidermis which is only present in the thicker skin because of this the consistency of the dermoid cyst which is present in those areas is quite hard to form so uh, many different clinical feature may be absent here okay simply because of this consistency now teratomatous dermoid okay let's talk a little bit about them a bit of re repeated actually it arises from totipotent cells totipotent or pluripotent cell which are uh, present okay in the gonad please mute yourself it is present in the gonad uh, either uh, ovary or the testes they have all three germ layers element ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm every student know that now some of the derivative comes from ectoderms are skin here okay nail and the teeth skin hair nail and teeth even our central nervous system is derived from ectoderm from the mesoderm muscle bone okay these are the important one and endoderms are mainly the gland gland okay these glands are mainly derived from the endoderm so all different types of tissues may be present inside the teratomatous dermoid and they are mainly present in the ovary testes retroperitoneal area and in the mediastinum now what is mediastinum where it is present mediastinum the area between the two lungs sir exactly i accept your answer abbas very good it is the area between two lungs or to be very precise you can say like this this is the area between two pleural cavity this is the area between two pleural cavities this is mediastinum it is divided into different parts first the superior mediastinum and inferior mediastinum and the inferior mediastinum is again divided into three type parts anterior middle and posterior anterior middle and posterior so in that mediastinum teratomatous dermoid may be found now see this this is one picture this is the pathological specimen actually this is a dermoid cyst which is cut open and different types of uh, you know structures or elements are present like sebum bone okay and hair this is excellent picture which is telling you what are the contents of teratomatous dermoid now we have come towards the you know end part of this cyst topic now, what are the investigation we like to do in case of dermoid cyst okay after this we have one more which is called as a ganglion i want to talk something about that also then end the end the cyst class but right now let's focus on the investigation of dermoid cyst 
we start with blood like total count differential count hemoglobin and esr because sometimes the dermoid cyst may be infected and there may be abnormal findings urine examination can be done okay as a part of a routine examination fnac what is the content of that cyst we, we can go for fnac fine needle aspiration cytology it is one of the basic surgical test or investigation you can take x ray and i already told you the subjacent or adjacent bone is eroded by the dermoid cyst because of the constant pressure there ultrasound can be done and it will tell us whether this mass is cystic or solid now you may be ask a question here we are talking about the cyst so why ultrasound is necessary but remember sometimes the dermoid cyst may be non fluctuant type of swelling and it is quite firm to hard so we are not certain whether this is a cyst or the solid mass and ultrasound is the best investigation to find out that if you believe it has intracranial extension in the head then ct scan can be done or in the mediastinum if you suspect there is a medi sorry a dermoid cyst then ct scan is the best investigation in the retroperitoneal area also ct is the best now what is the treatment so treatment is excision okay easy answer it is excision excision means complete removal of the substance along with its wall that is called excision you see that this is the slide which is showing treatment of implantation dermoid here so implantation dermoid is formed on the dorsal surface of the hand now the surgeon has given the incision which is here and the contents see this contents are leaking outside these contents may be the mixture of sweat sebum okay and some of the denuded epithelium after you remove the contents then the whole wall of the cyst has to be removed okay make sure it is completely removed and then you can suture the things so this is how it is done it is not a difficult at all uh, even uh, you know the doctor who have just passed their uh, you know or who just got their degree can do this under supervision now let's talk about what is a ganglion okay or ganglion cyst now if your teacher asks you what is what is a ganglion then your answers can be of two types isn't it the answer can be it is a collection of cell body of neuron in the peripheral nervous system this is also known as ganglion now can you can you give some examples of those ganglion can you take some name of those ganglion yes which are present in the peripheral nervous system anybody like what what are the example dorsal root ganglion dorsal root ganglion trigeminal ganglion exactly trigeminal ganglion submandibular ganglion otic ganglion okay autonomic ganglion exactly autonomic ganglion you are right so these are the different example so these are the favorite questions which is asked by the teacher now that ganglion is a different one but this ganglion which we are going to talk about is an example of synovial cyst now let's talk about it they are among the most common tumors of the hand and wrist they are not the real tumor though a tumor uh, whenever there is swelling you know we can simply use the term tumor there because the meaning of tumor is actually swelling but they are not the real tumor for the most part they are asymptomatic mass which are primarily cosmetic rather than functional disturbance they don't do any damage there but it doesn't look good or nice that's why it is written as a a cosmetic problem rather than functional disturbance so it is purely uh, you know uh, the patient's wish whether they can uh, they want to remove it or not so we whatever patient say we follow that you know we don't uh, 
uh, advise them to remove it. We just say, if it is making you uncomfortable, we can simply remove it. The removal surgery is very easy. It is not complicated. You always, uh, you know, give options or choice to the patient. Never direct them. Ganglia are, are frequently attached to a tendon sheath or the joint capsule, but usually they do not communicate with the joint space. Rather than joint capsule, they are mainly attached to the tendon sheath. Now let's talk a little bit more about it. If we take example of our hand, okay, there are a lot of tendons which are going and attaching to the finger, either flexor tendon or extensor tendon. And these tendons are, you know, surrounded by synovial sheath. They are surrounded by synovial sheath. So if any cyst develops from those synovial cysts, like it is shown in the picture, this is known as a ganglion or ganglion cyst. Now see this? This is such a common clinical finding in many people. They are asymptomatic, so we, we tend to ignore it. But this is a very good picture of ganglion. It is another one. Sometimes it may be dormoid if the person is having typical occupation, you know. So we need to be uh, precise regarding the diagnosis. This is another one. Now on the on the volar aspect of the hand or the wrist, or you can call it ventral aspect of the wrist as well. Here is another one. So this is very, very common in the population. Now, what are the clinical features? They occur more commonly in female. You really do not know the reason behind it. They are more commonly occurring in female and it may cause discomfort with activity impairment of mobility or most importantly the cosmetic concern. They don't like if there is a swelling which is coming at that exact site. During examination they are compressible, they are trans illuminating because of the content present you know the content is quite clear and they are slightly mobile mass. The diameter may be up to 4 centimeter or sometimes even smaller or bigger than that not a very important point, but they may occur on the dorsal aspect of the wrist or on the ventral surface of the wrist also. Okay, and they may be found on the on the lower limb as well. So these are the clinical feature of ganglion. Now this is the histopathology. Okay, if we take a biopsy, uh, it will show mixoid change. Mixoid change means the content is liquefying into the mucus-like appearance. This is mixoid change. Along with that, there is cyst inside the mass and it is covered by synovial lining because it is developed by the synovial membrane. Now, at the end, what is the treatment? Treatment is removal. Okay, it is removal give a local anesthetic there and remove it. And sometimes you can inject corticosteroid injection at the site. And sometimes recurrences are also quite common. 